for joining us during the Lithum Partners Spring 2023 Investor Conference. My name is Robert Bloom, Managing Partner of Lithum Partners, and during this webcast, we welcome Jaguar Health, ticker symbol of JAGX on the NASDAQ, and their CEO, Lisa Conti. Uh, today, I've asked Lisa to run through the company slide presentation, and if time permits, we'll engage in a short uh, question and answer session at the end there. Uh, before I do turn it over, I want to remind everyone that uh, management is available for one-on-one -on -one meetings later today. Uh, if you've not already signed up and would like to do so, you can send me an email uh, at bloom, B-L-U-M, at lithumpartners.com, uh, or visit the website, lithumpartners.com forward slash virtual. Click on the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button, and we will look to get you taken care of there. So with that said, uh, Lisa, let me uh, turn the floor over to you to uh, start walking through the presentation there. Thank you, Robert, and I have to say this is my favorite and the most valuable investor conference I find. So thank you again for welcoming us and the opportunity to introduce Jaguar Health to those who don't know it and update people to those who do know it and will zip through those forward-looking statements, which I'm sure everybody can read very, very quickly, and we'll get into it. As a reminder, Jaguar does all its drug discovery from plants used traditionally in tropical areas, and we do have our first product approved. It is plant-based. It is organic, it is sustainably harvested, it's fair trade, and it is an FDA-approved drug. The brand name is Mitesi, the generic name is Crofelomer, and it is the only drug approved by the FDA under botanical guidance. Under botanical guidance, there is no practical pathway for a generic. So even though we have IP and patents and issued and filed all over the place, like any good pharmaceutical company, we essentially have a situation of exclusivity forever. What I'm going to be focusing on in this presentation is two what we feel are transformative events in terms of the inflection of the value of the company during this very, very difficult time in the market overall, and in particular, in particular difficult for small cap biotech companies, two late stage clinical events that can lead to meaningful revenue generation in the next year or so. Um, my Tessie currently is approved for chronic diarrhea and people living with HIV AIDS. That's a specialty market opportunity. Another word for specialty is relatively small market, but the key is that it is a pipeline within a product and there's multiple follow-on indications and those two late stage transformative events that I have mentioned and that you will hear as a theme through this presentation is a pivotal Phase three clinical trial for cancer therapy-related diarrhea, which we just announced last week, has completed enrollment, and we are on track for p-value top-line results in the middle of October of this year, and we are fully resourced for that event. So you're not going to see any horrible, toxic-type financings to get there. We're fully resourced to get to that event. The second opportunity, large opportunity that we have focused on is in the rare disease business model uh, uh, indication of short bowel syndrome and congenital diarrheal disease. And for these studies, for these indications, we have proof of concept studies that are going on that can lead to early patient access revenue generation in Europe, program that's not available in the United States, in Europe for rare diseases in 2024 get some idea of the size of these market opportunities. Cancer therapy-related diarrhea is the most common side effect. Diarrhea is the most common side effect, yet there's nothing that has been tested and approved specifically in that situation. When you think about chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting, that's a market that got created as new agents became available in, in for that indication, new mechanisms of action. And now these agents are used almost always prophylactically for prophylactically for cytotoxic chemotherapy, usually the first three days in the cycle. And that's a market expected to be about two uh, four billion dollars in the next couple of years. Four billion dollar global market. And about half that market is impacted by generic introductions <clears throat> as well. So really remarkable as we think about that as an analogous market opportunity. Diarrhea with targeted therapy is taken on a chronic basis for months or years in both the curative and the metastatic situation. So we're talking about really blockbuster in terms of the number of patients that can benefit and therefore all the benefits to all the stakeholders, including shareholders as well. Short bowel syndrome 
is a market uh, that is expected to be about a $5 billion market over the next five years. And again, a, a typical rare disease business model, relatively small patient population, about 40,000 patients around the world, high mortality, high morbidity, very expensive patients to take care of, lots and lots of complications. So that's how you get to such a large revenue situation with a with a relatively small population, but very, very important, very rewarding to take care of these patients. So again, these are the two indications that are the theme of where we're putting our activities, our efforts, our resources for transformative clinical events in this year to lead to meaningful revenue generation in the next year or so. Um, in the category of the rare disease business model, there is uh, short bowel syndrome is an intestinal failure situation. We're going to talk about the clinical implications of that in, the mo in a moment. There's another intestinal failure situation called micro microvelous intestinal disorder, which is a subset of an already small indication of congenital diarrheal disease. Same formulation of our product, same type of trial design with intestinal failure. We'll be filing an IND for that indication in the second quarter of this year. We're already in, what are we, all, we're already in, in May, so literally just around the quarter. And that's an ultra rare indication for which there's no alternative treatments. So add that to these transformative events of the p value of the cancer trial and the proof of concept publications for short bowel syndrome. We also always have business development discussions going on. We have global unencumbered rights to Crofelmer for all those indications that you saw. So you never know when one of those business development deals is going to come to fruition. So for example, earlier this year in the first quarter, we completed a joint venture around a pipeline opportunity. This is not Crofelmer. This was in the area of, of mental health disorders, mood disorders, and looking at um, our pipeline of 2,300 plants, where might we have some unique opportunities, some novel plants, some novel mechanisms of action to potentially treat and potentially cure mental health disorders with total, totally new approaches? And we uh, partnered up in a joint venture with a company called Filament Health and then brought in outside funding from a venture organization called One Small Planet. That deal was valued post money at about $5 million and uh, brought in $1 million of funding and Jaguar owns about 40% of it. So that's some additional value in the company that I don't think it's recognized on our, on our, our balance sheet. The motivation behind this was the emerging field that a lot of us are reading about, not only in the science press, but the popular press about psychoactive and, and psychedelics, MDMD, psilocybin, um, ketamines, again, new new ways with old psychedelics of trying to pair, for example, sometimes novel mechanisms with therapy to sort of you know, break open new ways to think about treating and curing mental health disorders. A lot of these companies are very well funded, a lot of research going on there, but they're all chasing basically the same seven things. What is the next generation of novel mechanisms of action? And in particular, embracing where we have distinct competencies in the botanical world, working with um, natural products, working with the botanical guidance pathway by which Profelimer was approved, which can provide for the acceleration of the opportunity to get into clinical trials with plants that have a long history of safely being used in traditional cultures. So what we're looking to do at the end of the first million dollars of funding, which is about a year, maybe a little bit year, of uh, Magdalena Biosciences, which is the name of the joint venture, to move that first product into human clinical trials. And the first indication that we're focusing on is attention deficit disorder, particularly as um, adolescents transition into adulthood. Back to Crofelomer, okay, our late stage product here. Crofelomer has so many different potential indications and potential patient populations that it can help because of its novel first-in-class mechanism of action. It basically is a normalizer of gut function, and it's important what it does do and what it doesn't do. What it doesn't do is it is it does it's not, or I guess I should say what it does do is it acts locally in the gut. So it's not systemically absorbed. So you don't get drug-drug interactions, very important in complicated patients, 
short bowel syndrome patients, cancer patients, HIV patients, where you don't want to interfere with their life-saving medications. You don't, you don't get a first pass effect. You don't get secondary metabolites causing problems out there later on. Safety is a huge, huge asset and hallmark of this product. What it, it doesn't do is it doesn't um, it's not an opioid, so Imodium loperamide, these work by the mechanism of constipation, so we don't have the risk of constipation, not an antibiotic, so you don't have the risk of resistance, it's non-addictive, so remarkably safe product that can normalize gut function, as I mentioned, in many different patient populations where the advantages of this product are really, really shine are these very complicated patients, and that's one of the reasons why we target chronic situations where patients are often on other medications that you don't want to interfere with. So cancer therapy related diarrhea, as I mentioned, we have completed enrollment for that clinical trial. The label that we are looking for and the design of the trial is prophylaxis and symptomatic relief of diarrhea in adult patients with solid tumors receiving targeted cancer therapies with or without cycle chemotherapy. This is a first of it. So when I say prophylaxis, think back to the market opportunity that I mentioned for chemotherapy-induced nausea and vomiting. Again, these products are in the guidelines to be utilized prophylactically as the patient starts their cytotoxic chemotherapy. That's exactly the situation that we're looking for with targeted therapy. Again, targeted therapies are taken usually for, for months and years for the life of maintaining the patient either in a curative situation or in a re, 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 uh, remission situation. Um, it's a first-of-its-kind study in that the endpoint is patient-reported outcome. Patient voice is, is strewn throughout this indication, strewn throughout this company is very important and we're embracing it. It's also a basket trial, first of its kind, that is taking account of all solid tumors, patient with all solid tumors, and a basket trial in that it includes all targeted therapies that have more than 50% of any rate diarrhea, which is many, 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 many targeted agents. So there's many, many agents that are in the clinical trial. Uh, interestingly, there was a phase two investigator-initiated trial that was presented at San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference two years ago, was published about a year ago, and our data will be out in mid-October, is expected to be out in mid-October, which will be just in the nick of time for late break breakers for the San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference this year. So you can look to not only have that p-value released in uh, in October, top line results, but then a further publication at San Antonio Breast Cancer Conference, and then obviously a full publication we would look for for ASCO in 2024. <clears throat> the interesting thing about diarrhea uh, in cancer patients is it's not only supportive care, dignity, quality of life, comfort for the patient, which is very, very, very important. But it also impacts the outcome of the cancer treatment for the patient. <clears throat> About 40% of the time, cancer patients go off of their therapy or they go to a subtherapeutic dose. Excuse me, just for one sec. <clears throat> Frog in my throat. Because of the side effect of diarrhea. It also costs about three times as much to take care of a cancer patient with diarrhea. And so now you're getting the attention of the of the insurance companies um, and, and the financial aspects of taking care of cancer. So as I mentioned, enrollment is completed. The enrollment target was 256 with the rolling time to close down centers. We'll probably end up with 10, 15, possibly yeah, about 10, 15% over enrollment, terrific, you know, greater, greater power. It's powered at over 90% as it is. Uh, international study, United States, as well as some important international sites, which really accelerated the enrollment. Taiwan, Georgia, the country of Georgia, Serbia, Argentina really have been terrific partners, as well as all the sites that we have in the United States. I'll move now just to talk about um, the rare disease business model um, markets that we have focused in on. Rare diseases are not all that rare when you think about them collectively, about 10% of the population. It's an interesting business model, often for small companies, because 
of the chronic nature of these patients and how, how much they're costing the healthcare system, there are you know, large impacts that can be made on the life of the patients and large reimbursement opportunities, large market opportunities. You get some advantages, you get some tax advantages, you get um, more advice, easier facilitated advice from regulatory agencies. Also your trials, you have small patient populations. So your trials are smaller numbers of patients, which keeps costs relatively under control uh, in the pharmaceutical industry. So it's a very interesting business model. We are focusing on it, as I mentioned, for short bowel syndrome and congenital diarrheal disease. If we talk about short bowel syndrome first, there is a product that's out there now called Gaptex, it's hard to pronounce, tagutatide, which is a GLP analog. Um, basically, it's, it's a growth hormone. And it has sales of about, um, oh, let's see. Well, the annual reimbursement is about half a million dollars a year in the United States. It's a little less than that, maybe a couple hundred thousand dollars a year in Europe. It only has about one to 2% um, market share. Um, and it's not considered standard of care, but nevertheless, it is reimbursed at that level. So let me tell you what that what uh, that looks like. What happens with a short bowel syndrome patient is our gut, you know, a normal gut, maybe 20, 25 feet. Short bowel could be five feet or less. It could be as small as 30 centimeters. It's a very heterogeneous population because of how short the intestine is, what part of the intestine has been removed. Is it a congenital situation? Was it an accident? Was it due to necrosis, Crohn's disease, IBD? Was it a surgical situation because of cancer? Anyway, often what happens to these patients is they don't have enough surface area to absorb the nutrients of life, proteins, fats, carbohydrates, minerals, vitamins. And so they often end up on parenteral nutrition, which can be as much as 20 hours a day, seven days a week. So huge impact really on quality of life to be connected to a tube like that. Big, big, big opportunity for infections. There's all sorts of complications. Artificial per parenteral nutrition doesn't match exactly what your gut normally absorbs. And so, as I mentioned, there are often very severe side effects with these patients. So what Teglutaguide was looking to do is after adaptation, after surgery, be able to, it's a growth hormone, grow the intestine a little bit so that perhaps there's a little bit more time for the patient to absorb their own nutrients of life and reduce parenteral nutrition even by 15 or 20%. That's what it was approved on. What we're looking to do with crofelomer as an anti-secretory is to do decrease those secretions for the same endpoint. So reduce the need for parental nutrition because there's a greater opportunity to absorb the nutrients of life. Additionally, forms work towards form stools. As you can imagine, what goes in comes right out of these patients like a sieve because their bowel is so short. And specifically measure quality of life comfort to the patient's life. There would be no reason why crofelomer would have to wait for full adaptation of surgery. It could be used before a growth hormone. It could be used with a growth hormone. If there was a need for a situation like that, it could be used sooner, and it can be used based on the safety data that we have chronically in a safe way. Um, Gatex does have limitations in safety for cardiovascular issues and endocrine issues. Part of the reason why it, it doesn't, it's not considered standard of care and it doesn't have a very high market share. So the intestinal failure situation that I just described for short bowel syndrome is the same situation, intestinal failure in congenital diarrheal disease and MVID, although in that situation, the gut is intact. It's not short, but it's not functioning. So the same situation, the patient is um, on parenteral nutrition, essentially full time, but there's no opportunity for a, uh, for a GLP analog intervention because the gut is fully intact. There's no growing the gut that's necessary. It's just not functioning. So there's no 
alternative pharmaceutical treatments out there. It's a wide open piece of paper, remarkably rewarding to be able to work in this patient population and to be able to have some benefit. And parents talk about just the opportunity for their child to even have one night off so they could go to a movie, so they could go to a sleepover, so they could go to school, so they could have any bit of normalcy in their life. Look for that IND in the next 45 days or so in that's where we expect to also have some proof of concept data this year that could be utilized for early patient access in Europe, revenue generating early patient access in the next year. Uh, we do have a subsidiary in Europe called Napo Therapeutics with people locally in Europe that are focused on the um, early patient access implementation of our rare disease business model, which can bring in revenues, as I said, in the next year or so. And we do have another rare disease that um, we are focusing on, which is cholera. Cholera is an orphan indication in the United States. And this is with the second generation anti-secretory product that comes from the same plant as Profelmer, though it is not Profelmer. We have a small business in animal health, and interestingly, our first product there, our first prescription product there, Canalevia, is for chemotherapy-induced diarrhea in dogs. Cancer is a growing, heartbreaking problem in dogs. About 50% of the dogs over the age of 10, remarkably similar cancers between dogs and children, interestingly, almost like the dogs are a bit of a sentinel out there, uh, you know, in certain highlighting in certain geographic areas and certain age groups and patient populations where there are accelerating cancers and the types of cancers. This product's been on the market just about a year right now. We're seeing nice growth as a conditionally approved product. It's sort of like orphan designation. Um, sort of like the early access problem, get the product out there for this unmet medical need in a reimbursed matter while we are continuing to go through for full approval of this indication. Our turn, we just did our uh, first quarter results. We had about five quarters of growth, and this is my testing only for the HIV indication. That is the only indication for which we're approved um, to currently to, to promote and sell. And we, we had a bit of a dip in the first quarter of this year. That often happens because of the donut hole of Medicare, but it's a bigger dip than that, and we have to own it, and we are looking into it, and we're we're wondering, have we lost some of the patient voice, which is so important in a supportive care indication and so important for us to understand as we prepare to move in the cancer therapy-related diarrhea market where patient voice is so important in so many ways from uh, approval guidelines to awareness and enabling the patient to stay on their therapy. So these are some of the key milestones that we talked about. They're meaty, they're business related, they're clinically related. And so there's a lot of news coming up and those two transformative events in the fourth quarter of this year for which we are fully resourced. Do not expect that there would be any further dilution for our ability to get to those transformative events. Our team is fully in place. There's about 10 of us who've been together for over 15 years, or uh, yeah, about 10 of us for over 15 years, three of us have been together for over 30 years. So we have a lot of institutional knowledge and full commitment to bring this product to as many patients as necessary and all the stakeholders that will benefit. Really, really important scientific advisors, which are, are key to the um, investigator initiated proof of concept studies in the rare disease business model. Um, this is what I told you, the key investment highlights. The one point that I will focus on is the proprietary position. As I mentioned, we do have 145 patents issued, more pending, more being filed all the time. Yet we essentially have exclusivity forever with Profelomer because of the approval under botanical guidance. So thank you very much for listening. And I will turn it back to you, Robert. Perfect. Yeah, if you could uh, go ahead and uh, perfect. There we go. Um, yeah, I think we got time for just a couple of questions here. Um, you know, you've touched on this a little bit, but you've sort of spoken at length about the company's core initiatives for for 2023. You know, just sort of talk about the the motivation behind sort of the the focused activities there. Yeah, thanks for for that question. You know, we there's you know, 23 under plants in our library. There's so many things that we could work on. All the follow-on indications, eight follow-on indications for Crofelmer. We can't do everything, so we we chose those 
activities that would bring late stage clinical results in 2023 with a very clear pathway within the next year to bring in revenue. So for example, what did we not do? So I mentioned the, the rare disease program in cholera. We have an IND approved, ready to go for cholera with the second generation anti-secretory. In the next year or so, what that would generate is phase one, phase two data. We felt in this market environment that that you know, might not be a, a type of benchmark that would bring great value recognition. And so could I justify putting our precious resources towards that? Because precious resources typically come with precious dilution. So it was really focusing those activities to those late stage activities and letting some other pipeline opportunities be out there for another day. With the exception of Magdalena and our psychoactive and psychedelic, that was an asset that was sitting there. And so we mobilized an asset with outside funding. And the expectation there is that the clinical and the commercial work would be done by yet another partner that is brought into Magdalena Biosciences. Right, right. Okay. Um, you know, our, our patient advocacy initiatives expected to be sort of fundamental component of I guess the commercial launch of of Crepelmer for CTD uh, again, obviously assuming FDA approval uh, for for the syndication. Absolutely, it, it's it's foundational, um, and in every way, it it's critical in cancer to get into the guidelines so that when all these different cancer agents are prescribed and there's so many new protocols coming out all the time, it just, it automatically happens. Automatically, you will be prophylaxed for your diarrhea, for the comfort of the patient, for the expense, the success of the treatment. And also sometimes that diarrhea takes off and it's hard to bring back. You got to take the patient off their therapy. So patient advocates can make a difference in getting into the guidelines. They can make a difference in the FDA providing expedited review, Obviously, in the educational side, um, advocating for themselves with, with their, their physicians, um, working with the nurses, because that's who often has more time to talk to the patients. And we may have proved the negative. We may have lost a bit of that patient voice in HIV, and look what happened to our sales and our prescriptions. So we are learning from that, diagnosing that, fixing that before we get to the much, much larger market opportunity of CTD. So it's full circle. And it's also, you hear cancer patients, cancer patient advocates talk about the learning that has come from HIV and now it's going full circle. Yeah, what you and I were, we had a discussion earlier, a couple of months back on sort of orphan drugs and, and certainly would encourage everyone to, to take a listen to that if they have a moment, but you know, Maybe just remind you, what led Jaguar to sort of begin focusing on these rare and orphan diseases? I think the first thing that makes us focus on any disease is the patient need. And in particular, these patients are so, so ill, so sick. They're so grateful for anything you can do. As I mentioned, if you can just get them off of parenteral nutrition to enjoy some, some moment in life. So definitely the patient need and patient motivation and the novel mechanism of action that we have with crofelomer. And then um, the establishing NAPO therapeutics in Europe, and we really saw that opportunity for early patient access, again, to get the product to the patients more rapidly. What early patient access is, is based on the published proof of concept data, the EMA will allow you to have the product or allow physicians to prescribe it to the patients and have it reimbursed in four countries. This is available while you're going through the full development program. That's something that there are some patients groups like the um, uh, ALS group has been lobbying the FDA, but we don't have at the FDA yet. So patient need, and you know, we are a company, the financial motivation, the opportunity to bring in some revenues earlier. Yeah, perfect. You know, I think we're we're sort of wrapping up our, our time here. So, you know, Lisa, thank you as as always for for your time today. We we always greatly appreciate it. Um, I guess I'll just uh, sort of remind everyone if you've uh, not already signed up for a one-on-one -on -one meeting and would like to do so, again, shoot me an email, bloom at lithampartners.com. Uh, visit the website, lithampartners.com forward slash virtual. Uh, click on the one-on-one -on -one meeting request button. Uh, we'll take care of, uh, get you taken care of there. Uh, so again, we hope you all enjoy the conference. Uh, Lisa, as always, thank you so much. Thank you. Appreciate it.